Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Words, Images, and World. I am joined today by author, comics creator, Stephanie Williams. Stephanie, thank you for Hello. jumping on. You look like you're yes. in kind of a cerebro. Cerebro, yeah. Yes, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Nice uh, crossover to the Marvel Universe here, although I know you primarily through the DC Universe. Yeah, funny enough, uh, same background. Even when I would be on uh, calls with uh, DC editors, I'm just like, hey, I'll be like, this Cerebro is safe space, so I'm so sorry. Um, oh, yeah. But Do they get offended this is that? where we are. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> good, 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 good. Um, so, I, of course, I first discovered your work in Nubia, um, which is just a, a cool connected book. I find, you know, it's it's difficult to find new things sometimes within old territories and older stories. And sometimes people just kind of do the same thing. And I love that Nubia brings a character that's really been part of the DC universe for a long time uh, and brings her to the forefront in a way that she hasn't been. So uh, I really appreciate that. Um, but what led you to the world of comics creating and comics writing? Yeah, um, so comics have been a part of my life since I can remember. Um, in fact, uh, X-Men was my introduction to comics, but it actually wasn't X-Men comics. It was um, an arcade game. Um, there is yeah. a laundromat that we frequented whenever our washer and dryer was on the fritz, and there was Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time, and, and I think it's um, it's either Marvel versus Capcom or um, Street Fighter versus X-Men, one of the two. Whichever one mm -hmm. where Storm goes, uh ty uh typhoon typhoon that's the one that i played a lot of so um in that uh, that was my exposure to um the x-men and then of course later the broader marvel universe uh because once upon a time ago uh you could go to um a thrift store and find comics um and one of the comics that i found was an old issue of avengers i think it was either Avengers 361 or 371. I don't remember the exact number, but um, in that story, um, it's uh, Black Knight, Cersei, and Crystal. Um, they got those cool bomber jackets and they're kind of like in this love triangle and Vision is there uh, being Vision and stoic and um, pontificating about uh, a love, which is hilarious because I later found out that he had his whole thing with Scarlet Witch and I was like, oh, that's why he was so sad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I bring that up because um, it was very soap opery, and I watched a lot of soap operas with my grandmother, Young and the Restless, and Bo um, the beautiful, the Bold and the Beautiful. And um, I was like, oh wow, so comics is kind of like that, but like these people are going out and either you know saving the world or the universe, and I just fell in love. So uh, avid comic reader. Uh, but as far as school was concerned, um, you know, I was encouraged to go with something that was safer, which was the sciences, which mm. I later learned is not necessarily safe because grants can get not renewed or mm. taken away. And um, just like almost anything, um, you just don't know. So I um, went to school, thought I wanted to go be a doctor, but fell in love with research. And from there, um after I graduated, I worked in a hospital as an electron microscopist for a little while. And it wasn't until I had my son that I got back to creative writing. Um, I reached out to uh, a romance uh, novelist uh, who I really love. So next to comics, romance novels are my go-to. Um, reached out to her and it was like, hey, like I've been reading your stories for the last couple of years. And like, they've, I don't know, like they've just really inspired me to get back to what I want to do. Um, so uh, she wrote back and she was like, well, I, th you know, I think you'll be great at it. Like, just, you know, just give it a shot. So I started blogging about being a new mom and just using analogies to superhero comics and mm -hmm, sci-fi mm -hmm. and Alien is like one of my favorite franchises and also Terminator. And funny enough, the reason why is because moms, moms are really cool in those right. universes. So mm -hmm. um a lot of that and um, podcasting for a little bit. And then I started writing for uh, places like uh, Sci-Fi Fangirls, um, AV Club, and really just doing a lot of comic book deep dives um, and really mainly talking about Black, uh, black superheroes in comics because as I learned growing up, um, I don't really have any too, too many standalone books, at least not in the big two. 
Um, so yeah. because of that, a lot of the stories I had to like, you know, kind of cobble together and like, you know, for Monica Rambeau, who I fell in love with, I had to go uh, searching for a lot of older Avengers comics because, um, you know, it was an era where she was introduced and like she was really prominent um, and had a really important role. Um, Storm, of course, from the X-Men and um, just talking about these characters in a way that did not feel overwhelming and just letting folks know like these stories are here um, these characters exist. Um, there are more than um, two or three um, Black superheroines and you should know about them. Uh, so from there, I uh, did that for a little while. And uh, I, I don't know, like I built a Twitter following writing and also uh, making memes uh, using still shots from the X-Men animated series. And I think that was where it really started to click. Like, well, this isn't too different from if you, you know, wrote some comics because I'm writing stories based on these still shots. But if I were to actually get into writing comics, I can, um, you know, hopefully collaborate with an artist who will, uh, you know, draw what it is that I actually would like the story I would like to tell. So that's kind of how those two things kind of came together. And uh, Parenthood Activate, uh, I can only afford a page because uh, making comics is expensive. I can only afford a page, but I, I felt like these one page stories that made me think of, you know, the Sunday funnies, a strip. So telling a, a story in a very short, compacted, um, you know, one page, four panels or whatever. Um, and then it just kind of blossomed. I had a Kickstarter for uh, a comic that uh, myself and um, artist named O'Neill Jones put together called Living Heroes. It's based off of, it's like a mashup of Living Single and uh marvel superheroines uh, so it's like a little comic. like a fan comic yeah um because i just wanted to land the, the the whole thing was uh i was just curious uh, where would misty knight go to live um i again huge x-men fan so at one point misty knight and jean gray were roommates and then jean gray the whole phoenix saga happened i was like mm -hmm. man so misty like you gotta find a whole new roommate so Thinking about that and like Storm uh, having ties to Harlem do, uh, by way of her father, like Storm would have a brownstone. Um, I just love Monica Rambeau, so she'll be there. And She-Hulk could be our Maxine because she's a lawyer. Um, also, I just really love She-Hulk. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. just, um, it took off. Uh, I think that Kickstarter funded in like 26 hours and I was surprised because it felt really niche to me. Um, but uh, folks loved it. Um, a couple editors saw that and also my writing that I've been doing for Sci-Fi Wire. And <laughs> funny enough, it was an article I wrote about the best Marvel butts from the 90s, mainly just focusing on men, uh, just kind of oh, subverting nice. that <laughs> whole thing. of yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, a lot of Spider-Man, a lot of uh, um, like early 90s spider Man, a lot of butts butt shots in that between him and Venom. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. editor at Marvel saw that and uh, asked me if I wanted to do a story for Marvel Voices Legacy. Um, I wrote something for Monica Rambeau, two page story. So those short stories paid off uh, in helping me, preparing me for that. And then um, Nubia and the Amazons just kind of came that following year or so, which wasn't long, it was like two months. And I spoke to an editor at DC uh, because a friend of mine, Vita Ayala, had been approached about uh, doing a Nubia comic, but didn't feel comfortable because um, they identify as they them. Um, and they thought that um, a Black woman should, you know, be in the room to kind of tell that story. So uh, Vita gave the editor a copy of Living Heroes. Um, and then also an article I wrote about the Dora Milaje, plenty enough. Uh, oh, from comics nice. to movies yeah so that's where that connection came and that editor thought well absolutely love that piece and I think that you would be great to uh play in the world of the Amazon so uh next thing I knew um I was working on Nubia which really felt like a whirlwind um because <laughs> I don't want to say that I stumbled into working for DC and Marvel that's not absolutely that's absolutely not what happened however um it did feel like a whirlwind because, um, you know, I was making comics because I enjoyed making comics um, mm -hmm. and it just didn't cross my mind. Or maybe I just didn't give myself enough credit that I could be doing it professionally. Um, but I am today. That's why I'm talking to you. I'm very thankful. Yeah. Um, 
Nubia, yeah, and Nubia is a character that I've I've written about and covered in a, a podcast, and I was familiar with her history, which was next to nothing. Yeah, um, yeah. you know, aside from like a handful of appearances, and one is Supergirl uh, number eleven, where she's like unconscious the entire time, which is funny, but um, mm-hmm. <laughs> she's there. Uh, so it, it just felt like it happened at the at the right time. Um, And I had been a Wonder Woman fan for a while, but I don't know, like the Amazons and Wonder Woman were always something that felt um, like I loved it. Like I loved Diana, but I always felt like a disconnect um, because of, I don't know, just kind of the way that uh, Wonder Woman symbolism would be used um, when it came to feminist takes, but really more so white centered than more inclusive. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I thought about Nubia uh, becoming queen of the Amazons, how would her Themyscira look? Or really honestly, how should Themyscira look, period? Um, and I thought back to, and went back and read Joris Perez's run. And I'm like, that was the first center I really saw the Amazons look a little bit more like the world that I knew, um, which was a little bit more diverse. So thinking of that, the Cavern of Souls, and now using the Well of Souls, um, and I was like, if we're going to tell the story about Nubia being queen, then we need to make it so that not only do you care about her, but you need to care about the Amazons that she's governing over, like she's responsible for. If you don't care for them, then why would you care about her being queen? Um, so <laughs> it was just kind of, again, like a, a perfect storm because you have a character who exists, but doesn't have anything established. So um it was nice to I guess kind of do like a like a renovation a little bit uh the framework yeah. was there um but we got a chance to like really you know put the drywall up uh, figure out you know what nice fixtures and stuff we want um in and uh really kind of build um Nubia back up um to what we know her as today and again like I am just so grateful for that opportunity because um in all my time leading up to that, it was something that I didn't know I was being prepared for, but everything that I had been working on had led me to that moment. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's so great because there are these multiple runs of these characters that we love, but yeah. to to bring a character who's lesser known or on the margins and to bring them to the forefront to construct that world, it's it just works in, in this wonderful way um, that you bring about. So, and it sounds like we were maybe introduced to comics at around the same time because I think I remember that game. Uh, that it sounds. You, I'm really pretty familiar. sure there was like a Sega Genesis version and some stuff yes. like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely so. Like the the early to mid '90s, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, I love how you know pop culture has kind of embraced characters, and also given there's there's been a chance to pull characters out that haven't necessarily had the limelight and be critical about that in yeah. a way yeah absolutely um so because nubia um really didn't have much of a background um i still went back to read you know her first introduction in wonder woman 205 and some of it is problematic absolutely but the foundational pieces are there so I really love reading older comics <laughs> as a queer black woman. I probably shouldn't, but I do because um, for me, um, in a way that I've always viewed comics, um, they are just really great snapshots of the world at that time. Um, like a lot of media is. Um, the fashions, um, just what was going on politically in the country, all of these things, you could just, it's just, it just encapsulates all that so perfectly. Um, and for newbie around the time, you know, you have black exploitation going on. Uh, a lot of these care, a lot of these uh, black characters that came out of the seventies, heavily influenced by uh, the black exploitation era. Um, and I saw some of that in Nubia, and I like that I saw that um, because I was like, okay, well, she's somebody that has clearly wild folks that she still has fans, even though she hasn't really been prominent in the comics that's important um and also a little uh overwhelming too because if she still has a fan base that means that these folks have been making up stories for Nubia uh you know on their own Uh, so how do you compete with someone's imagination um so that was a little tricky but in those and in that in 
uh, her introduction, she comes with the mascara and like challenges Diana for the woman, Wonder Woman uh, title. And it was just so much conviction. And this is my thing. You have my thing and I'm challenging you for it. Um, I love that. That was somebody who was very sure of themselves. So there were still bits and pieces of her personality that I wanted to inject in um, this updated version of her. And it was just really important to give her, um, you know, a unique backstory, but also establish her as somebody who does not have to have her value tied to her proximity tied to Diana. Uh, for uh, some characters, a lot of characters of color, marginalized characters, when they are introduced as a legacy character, that often it hurts them in a way because um, you're thinking of them as the black version of blah blah blah, and like that's not that's not what it should be, or the Asian version of blah blah blah. It shouldn't be that. Um, so when uh, we were told that uh, Nubia would be queen, I was like, okay, well that's perfect. Um, that that's a great jumping up jumping off point because if she was champion of doom's doorway i love that i love that we were able to make that like that's why she's been gone all this time she's been working a basement job that's why you haven't seen her um so just thinking of that um i felt like that really tied into who we were introduced to uh when she made her introduction in wonder woman 205 um someone like that would be uh competent enough to be guardian of doom's doorway for so long um, and also, like I said, like that, that really, to me, helped me uh, kind of shape and mold this thing. Like she, Nubia has been there. She's just been down in Doom's doorway. You just haven't seen her. Mm -hmm. uh, so from there, going back and uh, looking at different forms of media to kind of inform who I always felt the Amazons were. Um, so again, like George Perez's run, but also Madeline Mil Miller Cersei. Um, I didn't want the Stemascara to be something where it's just like, oh, you know, it's great because men don't exist here. Well, no, there's still going to be problems. Um, that's not why Themyscira is great. Themyscira is great because the Amazons are um, a group of women who are committed to each other. Um, they are committed to their duties. Um, and at the very end of the day, uh, making sure that, um, you know, their sisters are okay. Um, that is why Themyscira is great. It's about community. That's why it's mm -hmm. great. It has is, you know, the absence of men. Sure, that's that's nice, but like I didn't want that to be the focal point of it because when I read Madeline Miller Cersei, um, men weren't the focal point of that. Like men were present, of course, like the gods and everything, but um, you know, women were the protagonist, antagonist, the in between, all of that, antihero. Um, and I think that kind of gave me the encouragement to say that, okay, well, if we're doing this story that just takes place on this island and it's just one central place, um, there are other ways to uh, to show tension and um, just, I don't know, like a discord without it having to be, um, you know, throwing punches or, you know, some big monster or an invasion of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what better way to establish the Amazons than to kind of show them arguing with one another um right. because that <laughs> I mean, happens in community too <laughs> it, it does and i think it's important that it happens in community as well because again things are going to be perfect we need to show folks working through um and that's where medusa kind of came into play um uh, because medusa was a character um we're thinking about the mascara as a place where women who are harmed in man's world they fall to violence whatever that violence is um medusa would fall under that so the whole thesis here is, you know, well, then if these women were blessed by the guys, then why was Medusa damned by them? If the way that she, um, you know, she 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 fell is very similar to uh, these women that were reborn on this island. And for me, another way to show how Nubia is different from Hippolyta or Diana or Philippus um, was to show how she would then interact with Medusa. And the fact that she had been guardians, a guardian of Doom's doorway for so long and pretty much like, you know, um, <laughs> her uh, keeping Medusa prisoner, like, you know, how does she um, explore that now that she's queen and she's no longer that guardian? She has to move a lot differently um, because it's a lot more than just um, 
keeping these women safe is listening to them and seeing things uh, from their point of view um, as most great leaders are able to do. Yeah. Um, do you find that your background in the sciences and in research informs a lot of your writing? I heard you say the thesis is. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, in a way is that... Yeah, it, it is. Um, the research aspect, absolutely. Um, it wasn't until recent, the real recently the real science of it all really started to come into play as I've written for characters like Shuri, uh, Moon mm -hmm. Girl. I was going to mention recently, Wakanda. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, um, these characters. Um, but no, like the research part of it, because um, I'm someone who is just really curious by nature and I want to look things up and whenever it came to writing, even if it's a piece about Amanda Waller, I'm going back and reading all of the Suicide Squad, the original by um, uh, John uh, Ostrander, right? I believe that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not That's right. messing that name up. But yeah, yeah um, I'm going back and I, I, I want to read that because um, I want to get an idea of who this character is, not so that I can repurpose it, not so I can basically copy and paste. No, I want to get um the heartbeat of this character so I can yeah. figure out um you know what are they doing in the situation or um you know how do I still write this character in a way that is very authentic to me but also true to who they are um and for me that is absorbing as much material as I can processing it and kind of letting the story uh honestly take me on a ride uh to whatever it is um because I've learned very quickly or I learned very quickly that you're not done writing until the thing is printed. And even if the thing is printed, you may not be done writing because there's always trades and something that if it needs to go, you need to go back and uh, correct something for that. But, um, you know, not being married to um, exactly what you have there, because since comics is a collaborative, um, you know, effort, once the art comes in, you may not need that dialogue anymore or yeah. something has been changed a little bit um, because the, the, you know, the artist felt that uh, to just tell the story better or for the page to just flow better that, you know, this panel wasn't actually necessary or we're merging the two. So, um, and, and I like that. I, I like kind of seeing uh, the different stages because it reminds me of research. Um, there are different stages from, you know, uh, <laughs> my husbandry to sell culture work to running your essays and all that like there are different steps um and sometimes things change things change or you tweak something and you get a better result you get a terrible result but you get a result at the end of the day and you're able to look at that and see what worked and what didn't work it's cool yeah i'm i'm all about the arts-based research too so that's yeah it's a really cool linking of the worlds and when you mentioned the sciences i was thinking about the new york times um jerry craft had like a one-page comic in that talking about learning all of these science terms and all of this wonderful rich vocabulary from marvel comics and i just yeah. thought uh -huh, yeah yeah big connections there yeah, yeah. So, so anything else uh you mentioned marvel and writing about shuri and uh, i want to also mention you have Wakanda. You've written in the mm -hmm. world of Wakanda. So anything that you'd like to share with listeners about uh, on that note before you talk a little bit yeah. about your your next steps as a writer and the things that we can maybe expect? Absolutely. Um, so Wakanda, I almost said no to. Um, and that's just because... And it's funny that I almost said no to that because you would think like, well, Nubia, that was a tremendous undertaking. Yes, but also Black Panther and just... The world of Wakanda as we know it today has grown exponentially since 2015. Um, and because um, with everything that Holtz did uh, really expanded that world in a very beautiful way, in a way that um, I always kind of wanted. Um, T'Challa was a character that I had a love-hate relationship with because um, he just reminded me of either like my dad, my granddad, or my uncle. Um, and not like in a bad way, but in a kind of annoying a little bit sometimes because like, you, you're not always right. Um, although that's usually how the stories play out. But 
Um, the reason why it was close to saying no is because of expectation. I knew that everything that was going on as far as uh, leading up to the movie with recast T'Challa and just the internet can be a very scary place. Um, and then also, I, I just wanted, I just wondered what I would be able to, um, to bring to this character into this, um, you know, anthology series. And then, of course, I snapped out of that. So sometimes, you know, writers are insecure. I'm not insecure, but like you're, you're scared. <laughs> and yeah, I, and humanity, I, absolutely. Yeah, yeah yes. Um, but I said, no, like, I, I absolutely can do this because I love Shuri. Um, from the time that she was introduced to the comics, um, Shuri is a character that I just, I just love because she was so headstrong, um, cocky in the same way that a brother is, but more brash. And I just, I, I just love that. You don't really, you don't get a chance to see that again with, um, you know, black women characters in that way. Um, and it was kind of fresh to me. So given who Shuri is now, which I think is a beautiful blend of the MCU and also the comics, I was like, yeah. And then her mom. So I think that was, <laughs> I think that was a selling point to me because I was like, hey, can I like include Queen Ramonda in this? And they were like, absolutely. I was like, okay, well then I I definitely want to do this. Um, I want to, I want to tell the story of, um, you know, this character who is, obsessed with making sure that everything is okay um and she's going to throw herself into her work uh something that I could definitely relate to um and then this mom who is just like I understand that you have um we all have Wakanda's best interests but you cannot be prepared for everything sometimes life is going to throw you a curveball it's rhino rhino pretending to be a real life rhinoceros to get in um strange things like that will happen so um it was really fun to like write that story and you know, sure he's a superhero, but at the very end of the day, um, you know, a good pep talk and a hug from mom um, is great. Um, and I and I think <laughs> I think that's like my agenda as I am here in this comic space to uh, tell more stories of um, just supportive parents and comics because we don't often get that no matter who you are because it's comics. You got to have a tragic origin or something happens mm -hmm. to you. Like, like talk to the spider people. They've yeah, lost true. at least one or two people. Um, so yeah. True enough, yeah. Yeah. Or or I mean it's that whole Disney movie thing. It's like, ah. Oh. Yeah. Um, but to get that humanity that just as you were talking about looking back at a character's history to get that heartbeat. Um, that's that's really what makes characters come alive. So that's so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so as we're getting down to our last couple of minutes anything uh that we can expect any future projects that are not under nda territory that you'd like to to hat yes. tip and i know you'll probably be i think you're at heroes con yes um, because i'm north carolina based so i'll probably see you there i um, hope so yeah 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 um, um i'll be there cool, uh, cool it's right up the street um i actually need to visit heroes the comic store very soon um but that's neither here nor there uh but as far as upcoming work um i had to play in the world of magic the gathering which i only knew in name and in passing so yes i absolutely threw myself head first in everything magic the gathering and wow I, I know I didn't even barely probably scratch the surface, but there's just so much lore. Um, it kind of reminded me of <laughs> reading the Bible because I'm like, man, this is dense. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. yeah uh, but really fun. So I wrote a story uh, featuring Jace and Braska. Um, I got to do like a, a romance thing, which is also my agenda to put inject more romance into comics. Mm -hmm. Um absolutely enjoyed that um and then marvel asked me to create a new character so i co-created a new character uh named logan lewis she is the new nightshade so love it, love um it. the original nightshade is a character who was a villain but has been i don't even want to say retcon because it's really more of a character growth for her um, that she is now back on the side of good but Again, a uh, few a uh, few and far in between do uh, black characters get legacies or have a legacy. Um, so I thought for Nightshade that would be pretty cool because I saw similar. Um, I don't know, lives some very interesting about her story that she's 
a young woman who was very just smart, uh, just really into science, but lack of opportunities and ended up with the wrong crowd. So I thought, well, okay, well, what if there was a character that was very similar in that way, but because she had the support community and all of that was able to um, go a different direction in life, but because life is the way it is, even though she went in that other direction, there was still something that happened that changed that trajectory. So um, how do we like bring these two characters together? So I'm really excited about that. She premieres in um, Marvel Voices Pride, uh, number one, which will be out June 15th. The same thing with um, Magic the Gathering, The Noble. Oh, yeah, I think so it's awesome. Magic Gathering, Planeswalker, Noble, um, that also be out June 15th. And Little Rocket is going on right now. I have not seen Guardians. Yes, but yeah. I feel like uh, there's a lot of uh, heavy stuff that happens in that. Little Rocket is not heavy. If you um, were a fan of like Muffet Babies, um, Rugrats, or any of that, please check out Little Rocket. It's a fun time with Rocket and his friends on Half World. It's all, it's just, it's a nice fun. It's like Loki, uh, Alligator Loki. Um, yeah. And it's Jeff is in the same vein as that. So I was really excited when he asked me to write that because I love those two comics. Um, I really enjoy Infinity Comics, period. I feel like it's a really great way to kind of introduce folks to the world of comics and why they're so, why these, why these stories matter, uh, why they're important and why comics themselves should be, you know, highly regarded. Um, I understand that there's, there's just pictures and stuff like that, whatever. There are some really just impactful stories to be told and have been told in comics. Absolutely. Oh. They, they are complex. Yeah. And uh, one more thing I almost forgot. Um, I wrote a story for Sam Wilson. <laughs> My, uh, yeah. Um, that'll be coming up in, um, it's a Captain America, I think issue. I don't know what issue it is. I think it's 700. I could be lying. Don't, don't quote me on that. Um, but it's, um, it's a, uh, annual or anthology. And I believe that'll be out in June as well. I think the 16th. I got my dates all mixed up, but if you follow me on social media, um, at Steph underscore I underscore will on all platforms, it's there. Um, cool. I'm, I'm just really bad with dates right now. Unless it's a it's, deadline. It's a thing. Deadlines <laughs> yeah. are good. Deadlines yes. are good. Um, yeah, that's cool. I, I used Sam Wilson in my class just a couple of weeks ago, looking at kind of his intro and growth into Captain America. So very, very Yeah. Cool. Did you by yeah. chance cover, um, you know, his first time with the Avengers? um affirmative I, action i did not but that would be a great place to go from there yeah, yeah um my story may or may not be about that so yeah cool, cool. Yeah. very nice yeah, well we'll um we'll link the social medias the websites and all the things in the description of the podcast and uh you were talking about um rocket little rocket being an intro to marvel and the world of comics i think for listeners that might be a little skeptical about DC or that haven't read DC or haven't read DC in a while, uh, Nubia is also a great way. Oh, of absolutely. In and, yeah. Listen, as long as you were picking up a comic, whatever that gateway is, I'm happy. Um, and I don't know how I forgot this. Um, I wrote a encyclopedia. Um, it features a lot of unsung and strange characters in a DC universe. Um, please Ooh. don't ask me anything about crisis related. I, there are so many crises. I think I'm crisis out. Um, they, they are very, truly infinite. <laughs> yes, they are truly yeah. infinite. What a what a what a time! But um, that'll actually be out November seventh, and. Um, I, I really I, I appreciate that I was able to do that book because I, I love profiling characters and I get to profile some pretty fun ones. Some that I didn't even know existed uh, until then. And I was like, wow, the DC like cosmic side is mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. bonkers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was rereading some Secret Invasion, I think is what it was called from the late 80s. I was like, who yeah. is this character? Is this yes. under cats or what is this? Um, yeah, so very cool. <laughs> very yes. cool thing. You are a very, very busy person, very prolific. That's awesome. Yes. Um, if it's it's between it's that. Um uh, my son now is definitely into comics. Um, 
I'm pretty sure I am to blame for that. Uh, we were able to check out the Beautiful. Marvel exhibit at Dever the Discovery Place. So if you're in the Charlotte or area or near and around, please check that out. It's it is they have some original art there, um, and it's it's worth it's worth taking a family to or just to go by yourself. In fact, you should probably go by yourself. You you might enjoy it more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, well, thank you so much for taking some time to talk with us. And I know you're probably about to enter Cerebro and connect with some other people in the world and, and yes. all of that sort of thing. Who knows? Maybe some editors from D.C. are even in there. Who knows? Um, oh, they, they definitely are. They, they are they, there. That's good. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad they cross over. Yes. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I appreciate your work so much. And thanks so much for taking some time to talk with me. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. <laughs>